a few weeks ago, my son turned eight years old. And for his birthday, he got some Lego. Now, what do you do when you're a physicist like me and your son gets Lego? Well, of course, you start to play with it yourself. So now my son can be proud that his Lego is being featured in a TEDx talk. What I like about Lego is that there are many ways in which you can stack the blocks. For example, you can make a sturdy brick wall, as shown here on the left, or you can make a wall that you can see through, as shown in the middle. You can also connect the blocks on the corners and form a wall that is flexible, though very fragile, and that is shown on the right. Now, in each of these cases, I started with exactly the same blocks, but depending on how I stack them, I arrive at a different behavior or a different functionality on a larger scale. And even if I would have made these walls much bigger, and I would have taken a few steps back so I cannot see the individual blocks anymore, I would still be able to observe that behavior. Now, all matter around us is also made out of building blocks, and these are the atoms. And also here, depending on how the atoms are stacked inside a material, you may expect different material behavior on a larger scale. For example, our ancestors found long ago that certain materials can be very strong at room temperature, but you can reshape them if you heat them up. These are the metals, and they were used to create our first tools. Later, magnetism was found, another material property that allowed the compass to be developed. And last century brought the discovery of the semiconductor. And this is a material that has a built-in switching behavior and is now at the basis of all our electronics. At each step, you see that it is the available materials that determine what technology is possible. And the behavior of these materials always finds its origin in the atomic composition. Now, all materials that we have used so far in our technology were always either given to us by nature or they were materials that we could synthesize through chemistry. But in either case, it is a very small subset of all the materials that would theoretically be possible. So here you see the periodic table of the elements. And this lists all the different atom types that there are available. Imagine that you could choose any combination of atoms from this table, and I gave you the freedom to stack them in any form that you like. Just imagine how many different materials you could come up with. Perhaps one day, if we can design our own materials from scratch, we can implement new kinds of functionality that we cannot even imagine yet today. Now, unfortunately, it is not easy to descend to the atomic scale. An ordinary microscope can never see individual atoms because light simply doesn't work on the atomic scale. In order to see atoms, you need what is called a scanning tunneling microscope, which was invented in the early 1980s. So a scanning tunneling microscope consists of a sharp metal needle that scans over a surface line by line without touching that surface. And since the needle and the surface don't touch, you wouldn't expect a current to flow from the needle to the surface. But if you bring the needle really close to the surface, so close that the separation between the needle and the surface is as big as one atom, actually electrons can jump across. We call this process quantum tunneling. And quantum tunneling be depends so strongly on that separation distance that if the needle scans over a single atom that lies on top of the surface, the rate at which electrons jump across, and we call this the tunnel current, increases a hundred times. So this way it becomes quite possible to see individual atoms. And here on this image that you see on the left, which was made with a scanning tunneling microscope, every bump is a single atom. A few years after the invention of the STM, it was found that you can not only see atoms, you can, in certain cases, also use the needle of the STM to drag atoms around and reposition them. We call this atom manipulation. And this allows us to create structures with atomic precision. For example, this text was written by dragging individual atoms one by one into their positions to form letters. 
And this way you can make things that are truly, utterly identical because every atom is where you want it. If you take, for example, the A in AND here, and you compare it to the A in atom, you can say that these two letters A are identical to a level of precision that no two letters A were ever identical before. Now this picture is actually a movie poster for a movie that was made by IBM Research. And it is the smallest movie ever created because every frame of the movie was made by dragging individual atoms into their positions. Now, I must say that the plot of the movie can be a bit shallow at times, but the special effects are really worth it. So let's have a look. notice that the background of the movie is not always entirely smooth. You can see some ripples around each of the atoms. This effect is even more pronounced in this picture, which is a very famous example of atom manipulation. It is called the quantum corral. And it shows a circle or a corral of atoms that is being created. And as the circle nears completion, you see a very pronounced standing wave emerge inside that circle. Now that wave is actually an electron. And now you might think, wait, an electron, isn't that a particle? It is, but according to quantum mechanics, every particle is also a wave and every wave is also a particle. So here, atom manipulation allows us to see into the world of quantum mechanics. I was 13 when this happened, and I remember reading this in a newspaper. And even though I didn't understand all the details back then, I was thrilled by the thought that you can move atoms and that you can see quantum waves. Today, 24 years later, I have my own research group where we study experiments along these lines. So here on the left, you see one of our atomic playgrounds where we build all kinds of structures, atom by atom, and we learn how we can modify the nature of matter. So let's talk about that. To what extent can we actually change how a material behaves? For this, I would like to return to the example of the semiconductor. So in order for a semiconductor to function inside your electronic devices, it needs to have dopant atoms. Dopant atoms are atoms of a different type that are mixed in the semiconductor. Without these dopant atoms, the semiconductor wouldn't conduct electricity and it wouldn't work. Now, if your semiconductor is large, it doesn't really matter where the dopant atoms are. They can be randomly dispersed throughout your material. But if you shrink the semiconductor, because, for example, you want to make a really small device, you might end up with a piece that has many dopant atoms, or that has no dopant atoms at all. And these two pieces will behave completely differently. So as you shrink your materials to the scale of atoms, it becomes important where each atom is in order to preserve the functionality of your material. Now, colleagues of mine from the University of New South Wales in Sydney are able to do exactly that. They can position individual phosphorus dopants inside silicon exactly where they want and using that technique, they have been able to make this conductive channel that allows electricity to flow from one electrode to the other. Another material property that can be modified this way is magnetism. So 
on this slide, you see two structures that, is, that are built out of each 12 iron atoms. And iron atoms are magnetic. So here, each white atom has its magnetic north pole pointing up, and then each blue atom has it pointing down. So these atoms form what we call an anti ferro magnet, where the magnetization direction alternates up, down, up, down. And this is surprising because these are iron atoms, and iron atoms in nature behave quite differently. If you take a lump of iron, actually all the north poles inside that material will be pointing in the same direction. We call that ferromagnetism. So apparently, through atom manipulation, you can design atoms that would normally form a ferromagnet to actually form an anti-ferromagnet instead. You can take this one step further and you can transmit information this way. So here we see an experiment performed by scientists in Hamburg. And they have created two atomic wires that are anti-ferromagnetic. And these wires, they are connected to a single output atom, which is also magnetic. And now they have designed it in such a way that if either of the two input wires ends on an atom that is pointing down, then the output atom will be pointing up. But otherwise, it will be pointing down. So this is an OR gate. It's one of the simplest logic elements that exists inside your computer. But here, it's entirely made out of individual magnetic atoms. Now, all the structures that I've shown you so far are all still rather small. This is because atom manipulation is quite unreliable. It's easy to make a small mistake, and then you damage whatever you're building, and you have to start all over again. It happens all the time. I often compare it to the work that monks used to do back in medieval times when they copied scriptures. It's painstakingly slow, manual labor that requires endless patience. But last year, my team in Delft developed a new technique that allows us to scale up atom manipulation by orders of magnitude. So you might say that we have invented the atomic scale printing press. On this, on this image, you see literally tens of thousands of atoms that were all positioned exactly where we want them. The trick that we use is that rather than moving atoms, we actually move missing atoms here. So on this image, every light blue square is a single chlorine atom, and every dark blue square is a single missing chlorine atom. So you can compare this image to a sliding puzzle with many missing pieces. And just as in a sliding puzzle, if you move a piece in one direction, you effectively move a hole or a missing piece in the other direction. And all these missing atoms here are arranged to form a memory. So just like on a hard disk, we store information here in bits that can be either zero or one, except that here, every bit is represented by the position of a single missing atom, which can be either up or down. For example, the line that is now highlighted, you should read as 0110111, which is the international ASCII code for the letter O. So every eight missing atoms here in a, in a row form one letter, and this way we wrote a text. And the actual text that we wrote is a part of the speech of Richard Feynman, in which he predicted this to happen uh, about 60 years ago. Now, the total amount of data you see here is a few hundreds of bytes. And it is stored on an area that is approximately 100 nanometers wide. So let's think for a moment how small this really is. So this area of 100 nanometers, I have projected here on a screen that is approximately 5 meters wide. If I would display the cross-section of a human hair on this screen in the same scale, and a human hair is approximately 100 micrometers wide, it would be a circle with a diameter of 5 kilometers. It would be the entire city of Hasselt for the cross-section of a single human hair. And that gives you an idea how much information we could store on such a tiny surface in theory. Now, the memory we built is the largest structure to date that was ever built atom by atom. But we could go much bigger still. Nothing would stop us to go to millions of atoms or perhaps even billions of atoms. But there is a limit. 
And that is because everything we build with atom manipulation always has to be inside a vacuum chamber in order to keep our surfaces clean. And it also needs to be at extremely low temperatures. Otherwise, the atoms will simply not stay where they are. So practically, you can never build anything truly macroscopic this way. But that need not be a problem if you consider that the functional parts of our electronic devices, of our transistors, are already approaching the scale of nanometers, the scale of atoms. And if you can just modify the functional parts of a device, you essentially modify the entire device. And I foresee that in the next 20 years, we will see examples of technology that was made possible through atomic modification of matter. Thank you.